the universe is a crazy place, but we see that this explosion here is much bigger than, uh, than our lovely Earth. And we can go back a little bit to see kind of, because we're looking at the light image from this, right? So we are seeing the light photons. The actual, maybe you could say epicenter of the explosion could be smaller if it's kind of here, right? But even there, that's still really, really big. So Earth would not have had a good time, but that's why we are at one astronomical unit. We are a comfortable distance away from the sun, thankfully, but that does mean that these light photons hit us in 8.3 minutes. So let us go back to our light spectrum. Okay, so the sun is always emitting light. Uh, as far as we know, it hasn't just turned off at any point. So it's always emitting light. Most of the light that it emits is in the visible light spectrum. So what we see. So it makes sense that one of our primary senses and the most dominant sense for most people is visible light. And we actually see a very narrow spectrum that's like 380 to 780 nanometers around there, something like that. That's pretty close to accurate. We see just a very narrow slice of the light spectrum with our eyeballs. If, if you have really good eyesight, you can see a little bit into ultraviolet. Like I know that when I'm looking at the moon, um, of the full moon, I'll see the ultraviolet like halo around it. Not a halo, like in a, or the, the aura around it. Just like a very subtle ultraviolet pulsing light just immediately around the circumference of the moon. Uh, certain flowers, if you like look at the, uh, the piston and stamen, you like we have some uh, Asian water lilies in the garden here that it has like an ultraviolet like color to it. So if you have, and I have good eyes, so if you have really good eyes, you can maybe see ultraviolet, but that's basically it. Uh, but that's where the majority of the light from our sun is coming out. And then it has this um, very long curve going down there where it emits a lot of thermal radiation or infrared. And then also emits a lot of ultraviolet light, which is why you can go outside. And if you're out at the beach too long, you'll get a sunburn. No one wants that. Um, that's the ultraviolet light because that is strong enough now to ionize and break bonds. And so you get a lot of ultraviolet light hitting. You're creating a lot of free radical damage. You maybe even are breaking some DNA strands, single or double, causing, uh, you know, basically DNA repair mechanisms to kick into effect. Do that enough times, you, you start to get cancer. So it's, you don't want to get too much ionizing light, okay? Well, thankfully for us, under normal situations, the sun then radically drops its light flux or its irradiation, as we see here, for the extreme ultraviolet part of the spectrum and then the X-ray part of the spectrum. So we see that most of the light energy is in ultraviolet visible infrared. We do also have radio frequency emissions. We can zoom in specifically kind of like on this part of the curve right here. And then also even further in right there. So there's different uh, specific wavelength breakdowns on this chart here. You can screenshot that if you want. Uh, but once you get to x-ray flux, it's quite low. So here we see 10 to the 6, 1,000, 10, or 0 0.1, and x-ray flux is below 0 0.1. So the majority, again, the majority of light radiation is in here. Total solar irradiance, so this is all the light energy combined together, hovers around 1,362. And then during solar maximum, it may go up to 1,365. So there's a little slight variation. There is more light energy output from the sun during solar maximum. And most of that change is concentrated here. We see this green line. What's this green line? This is showing us the variability. So you notice that there's very low variability right here in the infrared part. That basically doesn't change from solar min to solar max. We get a little bit of change as you go to the lower frequencies. We see that our radio frequencies undergo some changes. So during solar minimum, our radio frequency emissions are like here. During solar maximum, when we have an active sun, we have greater radio frequency emissions like these uh, radio bursts from the sun. We, we probably had one from the solar flare, uh, but I couldn't find the, the spectrogram data for it. And we see that our variability in light output goes up as you then go into the extreme ultraviolet section, which again is strong enough to break bonds. And then into the x-ray section, it shows the highest variability because of these solar flares. It can be quiet and x-ray flux can be fairly low. And then boom, you can get a massive 10, 100, 1000 X increase in x-ray flux. 
And you also have about a 1000x increase in x-ray flux going from solar minimum to maximum. So if you're standing outside and you're like basically looking at the sun or you're sunbathing when there's an x-flare, the, the energy from that x-flare is not really hitting you. Not in terms of the x-ray flux, because that gets absorbed into the ionosphere. The uppermost part of the atmosphere, it generates a little bit more plasma up there and creates these stronger electric potentials and therefore these electric currents. That may interact with you in a little bit bioelectrically in a variety of ways, but in general, it's not like the x-ray light. Very little of it will actually get through the ionosphere and hit you. So you don't have to worry about like being burned alive by, by an, X, an X class flare or something. Maybe if there's like an ultra super mega flare or something, I, you know, I don't know what the upper limit is, but I don't think you have to worry about standing there and being incinerated by a solar flare anytime soon. Uh, but you will have those radio frequencies hit you and there will be more ultraviolet visible and infrared radiation from that solar flare. So there's, there's subtle changes, but the next thing I want to talk about now that we've broken down our light spectrum is, uh, you know, just in general, uh, we effectively, our entire uh, conscious experience is made up and determined by light and electromagnetism, which the photon is the carrier of the electric and the magnetic field, right? Because we see light, our ears have sound waves hit them and that converts into electromagnetic signals that travel down the auditory nerve. We have taste buds on our tongues that convert chemical bindings to electromagnetic signals. We smell things, olfactory, same mechanism. And then our sense of feel converts tactile sensation into electromagnetic uh, signals that travel through our nerves to our brain. And actually, even when I'm doing this, I'm not actually touching myself, right? Because the space between atoms, I'm sure you guys have all heard of that before. So we live in a weird, wacky world of electromagnetism, but fundamentally our entire conscious experience is based upon light. So it stands to reason, you don't have to be a genius, it stands to reason that changes in your light environment are going to have some sort of change in your conscious experience. That is going to be a stronger effect the more in resonance and in tune with that you are. The more disconnected you are, the less you're going to basically probably feel these effects. It'll still affect you, but it'll do so more unconsciously, which is probably not good for you, right? The more unconscious something is, the, the less kind of ability you have to work with it, order it, structure it, and work with, you know, utilize those energies harmoniously. And for your uh, true soul purpose and your consciousness evolution journey, you could say. So here we have, and I've shown this graphic before, we just uh, talked about this quite a bit on my um, latest podcast with Dan Waits at World Astrology Report. It's like a two hour long podcast going deep into everything on the sun, the consciousness of the sun, and much, much more. I'll link that in the video description after this video, but if you haven't watched that yet, definitely give that a watch. It's a great long form. Put that on on a lazy day or if you want to just like blast off to outer space, that is the podcast to do it. We talked about this in that video, but here we see uh, the relationship between solar activity and what are known as spontaneous social processes. So effectively something like a revolution, that's a classic example. It's kind of spontaneous. You know, there's of course underlying factors and there's a buildup to it, but it needs uh, that spark for the fire. You're, you know, everything leading up to a revolution was building a fire, but it still needs that spark. That's the spontaneous part. Well, look at all the significant revolutions. They all stack on top of solar maximum periods because here we have our solar activity wolf number, which effectively is like a measure of sunspots, but it's a little, a little different than that. It's like a yearly count. And so we see the American Revolution, solar cycle three right there, boom, solar maximum. French Revolution, boom, solar maximum. All these other ones, solar maximum, we don't show solar cycle 25 in this graphic because it's still underway at this time. So the question is, what's the revolution going to be for solar cycle 25 maximum? It's almost like every time we have a solar max, we have a revolution and certainly things are looking very spicy right now. If you have uh, any, any eyeballs focus on world events, you know that there's some very um, concerning things unfolding right now on the world stage. Uh, a lot of it's a show, a lot of it is not a show. So uh, this is just showing that in general, when you have higher solar activity, you have more energy output from the sun, things like these solar flares, these X flares, these solar storm impacts, uh, 
all that stuff, enhanced solar wind, all that stuff generally uh, energizes the earth geophysical system. There's a wealth of research into the connection between geophysics and biophysics. It's a very niche subject, but there are some good, some good souls out there who have bridged the gap that have the requisite knowledge in both to be able to bridge that gap. Uh, I'll put a link for one in the video description. It's a simple paper, not hard to read from 1964, just to show you that this goes back a ways. I'll do that after the video. Um, and then you have, um, in general, just because of this geophysics biophysics link, you have an activation of the metabolism and the energy and your, your, not, your autonomic nervous system. So your sympathetic system and basically cortisol, and it just kind of fires up the energy system a little bit more, which gets people a little bit more agitated, perhaps nervous, anxious, um, a little bit more individualistic, perhaps to kind of like to strike out and do kind of maybe crazy nutso things. So this is the relationship that we have going back to solar cycle one right here at the uh, mid 1750s between soil activity and um, spontaneous social processes. So uh, if you track this stuff, I'm sure if you track it often, I'm sure you know how it affects your mood like you yourself. And if you really track it, you'll also observe how changes in soil activity affect people around you. And then if you look at the more macro scale, you can track how it changes entire populations across time. It's really quite fascinating stuff. We talk about all that on the channel. If you're new here, hello and welcome. I'm your host, Stefan Burns.